Hello you. So it's another video of me washing up. It's just that Dee is busy planning the garden shed that we want to have built for the new hen house. Very exciting. The big plans are foot with the hens, but we'll go into that later in another video. Dee is mega excited about it though, which is awesome. Anyway, I've been thinking about this ration thing I was on about yesterday in my other video. We want to only eat rations from World War II, the 1940s period, for a week. Just to find out if we can do it, what we think of the rationing food-wise, and how we get on. There's a few things to consider that I've been pondering. First up, what do I get on the rationing? What can I buy? Well, there's only a few surprises when I've dived into it. But one of them, the most alarming thing is, you only get one egg a week. Now I like my eggs, I do. They're most useful for baking and cooking and go with your fry up in the mornings, especially on a Saturday morning. But I found something useful out. If you swap your one egg ration you can swap it for poultry feed and keep your own chickens. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be doing away with my egg and getting poultry feed instead. That way I can tuck into my hen eggs that are out there now. If they start laying that is. Hopefully they will. Chickens as well. They weren't rationed. They are expensive but they weren't rationed. So you'd have as many chickens as you wanted. You didn't have to ration them. People were encouraged to keep their own chickens for that reason. And also rabbits. Because rabbit meat is fantastic. And also, you could make a nice little bit of money on the side by selling the, the hides to the Rad and Bone Man, who would make clothing out of them, and then sell them on to help the war efforts. So if I do catch a rabbit, I'll be eating it, because that was actively encouraged. Which is nice to know, isn't it? Another thing I found surprising, looking at all the information about the rationing period, is the amount of fat that people ate. Your ration allowance was 250 grams of fat, be it butter or cooking lards, per week, per person. Now that is a full tub of fat and oil. We don't use that much in a month. We might use a very small amount in baking and for pastries and stuff. But nowhere near that much. And I wonder why. I'm going to delve into that reason in another video when I do this experiment thing. So I want to research it first and find out. Another aspect is we don't have to keep within the budget. Because back in the 1940s, 1945 I've looked at specifically, is that people spent 18 pounds and three pence on the weekly food shop. That sounds quite a bit. That's per person. That is that much in dollars, I haven't converted it yet, but it's down there somewhere. But 18 pounds and three pence per person per week on food. I know it was a time of economic stress in the country, so food prices naturally spiralled up. So I want to try and keep it within that budget and just buy what I need. And of course, what the shop sells. Because back in the day, shops were limited on what they had in. Same with ours. If the ferry gets cancelled, the shop might go without a few things for a few days. Food shortages, as such. So that's what the plan is. Something else that dawned on me when I was doing all this research is the sugar. People were given... Not given, they had to buy it. 
but they were entitled to buy 225 grams of sugar. That's about six ounces per week, per person. That, to me, seems quite a bit. But then, on the other hand, it doesn't. If I make wine, I shove in a kilo or two kilos of sugar per gallon of wine. So I would struggle to make my wine with that type of rationing. I'd have to save it up for a full month to get six bottles of wine. However, if you didn't make wine, that does seem quite a bit of sugar to go through. And also sweets and chocolates. You had your entitlement of... How much was it? 200 grams, I think, per month. We don't eat sweets or chocolates. Well, occasionally after dinner. You might have a after dinner party. You might have an after dinner mint. But I can't imagine eating that many sweets. But there again, I guess if you are with children, they would appreciate. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how we fare with the diet. I actually think it's going to be a lot easier than I think. Then all the details I found online about the rationing period. About 6% of the average household food came from free foods. And that includes hunting, fishing, trapping and growing your own. Only 6%. That does not seem much at all, despite the Dig for Victory campaigns that they launched. And even the allotments, a chunk of land where you can go and grow your own. But only 6% of the average household's food came from growing, or fishing, or hunting. Doesn't seem a lot. Because this year we're aiming for 50% of our own food to come from our own land. And I do wonder if that's because we are in a very rural environment where we can easily do these things. Where we can go trap rabbits, go fishing, lots. But if you were living in a terraced house in an inner city environment, you would have no opportunity, especially in like, inland city. city such as Birmingham. Well, they do have canals you can go fishing in, but I wouldn't want to. wouldn't want to eat anything I catch in Birmingham. wouldn't want to catch anything in Birmingham. Anyway, then you realise how lucky we are being up here in such a rural, remote place. We have all this opportunity to fend for ourselves, which is good, because we can supplement the rations with our own home court stuff and homegrown stuff. Downside though, we might end up having a few evacuees living with us. A few children who come to stay. Oh well. Dee, when are they arriving? Ooh. The evacuees. Don't know. Don't know yet. Haven't been informed. But the main come. You never know. Another thing about chickens that people used to keep during the war. They were so precious to families for their eggs. Many houses used their air raid shelters and Anderson shelters as chicken houses to keep the chickens safe. People would rather stay in the home and risk being bombed and the house falling down around them and the chickens being safe than the people going into the air raid shelter. Personally, I would be in the air raid shelter with the chickens. That'd be my plan. A bit smelly, a bit noisy, a bit awkward trying to sleep when there's a chicken walking around your head and that's the air raid sirens that are going off. But I don't understand that at this point. Give me a week, or when I start doing this week's rationing experiments, and I might realise how precious those eggs are. And of course, as well, there's the black market we don't buy stuff on. Shh, don't tell anyone. But there might be. There's this one person, a green grocer up here in Auckland. And apparently
apparently he got imprisoned for not dishing out the right amount of currants to people, or raisins to people. So he ended up in prison because he was trying to cheat the system a bit. Pardon? For raisins? For raisins, yes. And that, to me, just shows how important this time was. It's going to make us think as well about where our food comes from. Because during that period, it's very hard to get food into the country from overseas. No bananas. I remember my dad, he once had a banana for the first time. There was one banana between seven children. And he loved the tiny, tiny, tiny bit he had. So we don't need anything imported, such as bananas, oranges, butternut squashes, all those veg that we take for granted as a daily staple. So, we're going to be eating lots of potatoes, lots of leeks, lots of parsnip, lots of cabbage, all of which locally grown and reasonably priced as well as it was during that rationing period. However, potatoes were expensive unless you grew your own. It's the wrong time of year for us to grow any potatoes, so I'm going to have to forward out and buy some. So we'll be eating all of this local produce, producing our air miles down. Air miles? Food miles, that's the word. And also the carbon footprints. So it might be a healthier meal, healthier diet as such. Don't like the term diet. A healthier way of eating, apart from all that fat. About 250 grams of fat per person per week. Still I don't fathom that out. Anyway, a healthier way of eating, and also better for the environment. Maybe? So I can see the merits of this way of eating. But I do like my avocados. I think D will struggle with one aspect of it. The tea. The tea was rationed as well. You had your ration of about 20 grams of tea per week, per person. That's about three cups a day. Doesn't sound much. We probably drink a lot more than that per day. Anyway, I drink coffee. That wasn't rationed, so I'll be fine. Nice. So I'll give my ration to D. Coffee wasn't rationed? Coffee wasn't rationed, would you believe it? What? I know. Why? I don't know why. So I'll be having the coffee and giving D my tea allowance. That's so unfair. It isn't fair. Rationing the British on tea? Surprised we ever won the war with tea rations. Oh well. <clears throat> I always remember my nan. She was so paranoid about tea rationing. When tea bags came into uh, supermarkets, she'd go out and buy them, make herself a, a cup of tea, the tea bag in, and once she'd finished with the tea bag, she would hang the tea bags on the washing line to dry out, and then she'd reuse them. It's that old school, make do and mend and reuse, recycle, get the most out of every little thing you can. It was such a sight seeing the tea bags on the washing line. And the sea doors would come down and peck at the tea bags. And Madame would rush out in her dressing gown, with rollers in her hair, trying to scare these birds off from her tea bags. They were so precious to her, tea. Precious to everyone, tea. So I'm hoping to uncover more little stories as well. The social side of rationing. It's not just about the food for me. It's about how people interact with food. How people live the daily life. How important this commodity food was. Anyway, I'm going to do this washing up. And I'll see you soon.